Jared Polinfronos photo. Dot com and it's finally here. It's finally time to tell you that this is a preview of the Canon EOS R3. Now we had our hands on a pre-production model for about two days where we shot a bunch of different things. We started shooting the Philadelphia Union where we got to shoot them practicing soccer. No, Ted Lasso was not there. Then we photographed little Dan running through the park, whether I shot him with an 85 1.2 at 30 frames per second to test out the autofocus, we did that. And then I also photographed a skateboarder at the skate park because they're moving pretty quick right at me. And one of the hardest things for cameras autofocus to do is to have subjects coming right at you and this camera well we're gonna see how it did in that situation now what we didn't get to do was go into some photojournalistic situations super low light because we didn't have a lot of time we had a couple of hours to test out shooting this camera and also the hurricane Ida was coming through and we had to dodge raindrops in order to do this entire shoot but now let's get to the specs starting with the photo specs and what the camera looks like and feels like because this camera weighs 71% less than the 1DX Mark III. It weighs in at 1.81 pounds or 822 grams. It is so much lighter than that big boy. And when you pick it up, it feels like a great camera. It's just lighter and it's slightly smaller. And yes, the grip is built in unlike Sony's with the A92 and the A9 and the A1 where you have to get a grip for it. Same same thing with the R5 and the R6. I don't mind these days adding the grip, but it's nice having it integrated in because you tend to have a larger battery, which you do with this R3. If you're worried about build quality, don't be worried about this camera because it is weather sealed and it has a magnesium alloy under skeleton and it's strong. Now, Canon told us that this is not the flagship model that the 1DX Mark III is still the flagship because it does two things better than the R3. It has better battery life and it has no lag in the viewfinder because it's an optical viewfinder. I call it bullshit. The R3 blows the 1DX Mark III so far out of the water that it's not even funny. It does everything that the 1DX Mark III can do and it just does it even better. So I consider it the mirrorless flagship. No, Oh, screw that. I call it the flagship for Canon. Now it doesn't have a one in front of it, so it's not whatever that future R1 is, if it even exists. It's the R3, but it is, in my opinion, the flagship model. The R3 is targeted at the Sony A92 and not so much the A1, and definitely not targeting anything on Nikon side, Stephen, because they actually don't have anything that exists that's not vaporware just yet. Sorry, Nikon people, but it's kind of true. They're going after the A. 92, which is, you know, the less megapixel version, and the A1 is the more megapixel version, but you'll see by the end of this that I think it's small, smalls, I think it falls somewhere more in the upper middle of those two comparisons between the A92 and the A1. It's very close to the A1. It just doesn't have the same resolution as the A1. Speaking of resolution, we can finally tell you how many megapixels this camera is. It is a 24.1 megapixel camera. It is the first full frame Canon camera to use a BSI sensor, a backside illuminated sensor and it is a stacked sensor. Stacked sensors give you a faster readout which means you should get less bowing of baseball bats and balls and yeah it's very similar to what you would see in the A92. In fact they said to me that it should be better than the A92 when it comes to that but it's not in the same level as the A1 when it comes to the readout speed of the sensor. It's close but it's not there just yet. It is important to mention that the sensor was developed by Canon as well as manufactured by Canon. There were rumors that someone else was manufacturing it for them. We are told that it's developed and manufactured by Canon and it's in my notes so it has to be true. Now what I'll tell you is I was hoping that it was 45 or 50 megapixels because I'm kind of spoiled by the 50 megapixels of the A1 at 30 frames per second. I just love more. Why not have more megapixels? For me that's perfectly fine but every one of those raw files is about 103 megabytes every time I take a picture. With this one the R3 you're looking at 30-ish 
cache, 32, 33 megabytes per raw file in 14 bit when you take those photos. So maybe the news photographers want a smaller file because the JPEGs are going to be smaller, of course. And then you have raw files, which they generally don't always shoot. But I'm spoiled. And I talked to a bunch of different sports photographers and some of them are like, you know, I don't need 50 megapixels. I just don't, 24 is great. Other people who will remain nameless like Bruce Bennett, who has been shooting for Getty images, shooting professional hockey, has been using the R5 a ton and he crops everything. He'll tell you he crops everything. He's like the king of cropping. He'll crop to the nth degree and that's why he loves the 45 megapixels and that works for him. But for the sports shooters, for the photojournalist people, 24 megapixels is a lot. When I started shooting with my D2H, that was four megapixels. Then it was a D2X, which was 12 megapixels crop sensor. And then we got to the D3 full frame, which was 12 megapixels. Then we did 14, then we did 16. And with the 1DX Mark III, you're looking at 20 megapixels. I would love to have more, but 24 is perfectly fine. The ISO range is 100 to 102,400 natively. Now I didn't get to push it terribly too far because we didn't get to shoot in indoor situations, but I did test it out at 20,000 ISO shooting my mannequin. And as you can see, my mannequin is repping Sony with his Sony Alpha jacket. Now, the other picture, which is wider, you can see the other mannequin is repping his Nikon D850 jacket. And where's the Canon jacket? It? Actually, I think it's downstairs here at the factory, but we actually have one. But the 20,000 looks really clean in that situation. Now keep in mind, you could push the ISO up to astronomical levels in the darkness and you're gonna get gr noise and grain. But if there's no light, then it doesn't really matter. Pictures are gonna look terrible. The more light you have, even at higher ISOs, the images are gonna look clean. I think you're gonna be able to push this camera to a pretty nice amount uh, and, and still get great clean shots. We already knew that this camera shoots 30 frames per second. What we didn't know is that it doesn't dumb down the RAW file in order to shoot 30 frames per second. So when you're shooting those 30 frames a second, you are still getting 14-bit RAW files, about 30 to 32 megabytes, like I said. Whereas with the A1, you're gonna get 30 frames per second, but it dumbs it down to the 12-bit RAW files. But don't forget, it's 50 megapixels, so it's moving a lot of data data, but to compare it to the A92, when that's shooting at 20 frames per second, it's dumbing it down to the 12 bit as well. So to get the 24 megapixels, 30 frames per second at 14 bit is what I like to see. One of the issues that people have had throughout time and history of photography is the blackout time between photos. So when you press the shutter button, a shutter comes down, the mirror would have flipped up and you would kind of have blackout. So you would lose what you're looking at. In this case, we have zero blackout when you're shooting 30 frames per second. Now, if you're watching the EVF footage from this video and you see a, a blackout for a second or a split second, that's because of the e EVF recorder. You don't actually see that when you're shooting through the camera. Now, this isn't the first camera to do that. The A1 shoots just like that and the A9 and the A92 shoot just like that as well. But it is zero blackout at all when you're shooting those 30 frames per second. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you Fropac 3 in action on an R3 raw file, starting with Canadian Tuxedo, and boom, it looks good. Capone, right below there, gives it a nice look followed by Mount Airy. Mount Airy looks really good. People love this for kids and weddings. And then we've got Prestige Worldwide, which is like a catch-all. But one of my favorite all-time presets is Skittles from Fropac 1. And with one click, it looks like this. But first, I like to tweak some of these things. My exposure is off. That's not the preset being off, but I like to go ahead and do modifications, and this is Skittles tweaked to my taste. So if you're looking for a great starting point that you can go ahead and save your own preset off of, or you're looking to speed up your raw workflow, we created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets that you could check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you'd like to get the triple play bundle, which includes Fropack 1, which has Skittles, Fropack 2, and Fropack 3, you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. 
One thing that I wanna remind you of is how I shot the photos during this preview is I had the Atomos Ninja 5 on top of the camera plugged in to the HDMI so that we could record the focusing points moving so that you can see it in action. But what that means is my eye's not up to the electronic viewfinder, so I'm holding the camera out like this to shoot or on a monopod, I'm using the Atomos screen to basically be my electronic viewfinder. So it's not as stable. If it's a little more shaky, that's because of the way that I was shooting, but that's how we can show you exactly what the camera is seeing so that you can watch the autofocusing points in action and see how they work. But I also wanna say that all the video that you're seeing during this, that is not me sitting in this chair right now, is shot with the R3. So Steven was shooting all the video with the R3, all of the B-roll, all the clips, uh, everything of me is with the R3. But what you're seeing right here in the studio, this is still with the EOS R5. One of the things I questioned that Canon did in this camera is I love shooting at 30 frames per second, but sometimes I don't need 30 and I wanna be able to dumb it down to say 20. 25, 22, but I only have three options. I've got three, 15, or 30 frames per second are the only options. I don't see why firmware couldn't have been written to say, yeah, set your speed to whatever you want it to be. Is it a deal breaker? No, the 30 frames per second bursts are great. The camera's nice and responsive. The shutter button feels better than the A1. It feels better than all of Sony's shutter buttons. It just feels more responsive, and I don't find myself accidentally taking pictures like I do with the A1, which just chews up a lot of data. And I guess I should mention that everything that I've shot up to this point, or everything I shot with this camera, was with the electronic shutter. This camera, by default, is set to electronic shutter because it's meant to take advantage of the 30 frames per second, not the 12 frames per second that you get with the mechanical shutter. This is a whole new world. Steven, sing it. A whole new world, a new fantastic point of view, no matter near and far. I don't, there's place in cars. I don't, I don't, it's a whole new world with you. It's a whole new world. So yeah, basically aren't gonna be using the mechanical shutter in this camera. And that's why it's on by default to the 30 frames per second. One of the biggest concerns when you are shooting with the electronic shutter is, will you get warping of a baseball bat or a baseball, or in this case, a soccer ball? In this case, I did notice some warping of the soccer ball when the goalie was diving for the ball. Now that's when it was, it, the ball was kicked. And so of course it's gonna be deformed right when it's kicked. But when it's traveling in the air, it already has bounced back and should be a circle, but it does have a slight egg looking thing going on in certain situations. It isn't terrible. It's not as good as the Sony A1, but it, from what we're told is it should be better than the A92. And honestly, it's super minimal in this situation. And I don't think most people would ever notice it, but it's something that we need to point out is that it is slightly oblong or slightly egged out just a little bit in that situation uh, where I got it to happen a bunch of times, but most people aren't gonna notice it. And even for me, it, it's not a deal breaker at all. Flipping over the paper to page two of four pages of notes, I think the A1 had four pages too, is that correct? That was a lot of notes. All right, there is a full silent mode. Yeah, that's right, you can completely make the camera silent. Now, the A1 does that, you can make it completely silent, so you don't actually hear the shutter firing or anything, but they go a step further, that when you turn the camera off when you're in this mode, it doesn't even put the shutter down to make any noise, because you can have the option. Do you want your shutter to come down to cover the sensor, or do you want to leave it up? In this case, if you're in complete silent mode, it's going to leave it up so it doesn't make any noise. But they have another interesting feature is you can plug into the headphone jack with a wired headphone and you can hear the shutter going off in your head when you're taking photos. I wish it was kind of Bluetooth and I could be like, put something in my ear so that I could hear it shooting, but it, we're not quite there yet. Maybe one day they'll do that, but you have that option. Because with the Sony, I found myself accidentally holding the button down, not realizing I just took 40 pictures and just chewed up like four gigabytes of data because I wasn't aware that I was shooting. I do like hearing that shutter go off. Uh, I would love an, op uh, an option for haptic feedback, but anything that vibrates inside of a camera when you take a picture is going to interfere with your image that's being captured. So maybe there's like a wireless shock device I could put on my nuts 
Nope, don't want to put it there. Maybe it's something I could put on my arm that like buzzes when you take a picture. I don't know, would, would you like that on your nuts, Steven? No. No, Steven wouldn't like that, but Dan, you know what? Dan probably would. That's funny. Um, <laughs> But to add to that, if you don't want it to be completely silent, but you don't want it to be really loud, you have a whole bunch of different levels of volume you can do for the shutter. It doesn't sound like a real shutter because it's like fake shutter, but you can at least raise the volume or lower it so that you can basically hear it and nobody else can hear it. Now you do have smart controllers, one for vertical, one for horizontal, and it's interesting because it's right near the joystick. So it's like your thumb is here for the joystick and then your thumb is right here for the what's it called again smart controller but I really love the smart controller because you can move things around super duper fast and Steven just told me that I didn't even know this because he set up the camera is that the smart controller is not even active by default so that's something that in my opinion should be active by default now in terms of screens we have a 3.2 inch 4.15 million dot vary angle touchscreen on this camera. Now, I don't care about the very angle flip out rotatable touchscreen. I know some people do because they like to hold it up or hold it down. I still don't like the fact that it's not flush straight on with the back of the camera. It's always tilted up just a little bit. So it's very hard to get your angles in line straight uh, when you're holding it up or trying to look from the side on it. I know that's a small thing, but I wish that they could get it to a point where it was just even across the back. Now let's talk about the EVF. Look how far this EVF sticks out compared to the 1DX Mark III. Yeah, it sticks out pretty far. It is massive. Now it's massive for a few reasons. One, it's a professional camera and you wanna have that vibrant big electronic viewfinder and that just big viewfinder, just like an optical viewfinder, but except this one is electronic viewfinder, but also it houses all of the sensors for eye control. Eye control is something completely new and I'm gonna talk about that in just a second after I tell you that it has a 5.76 million dot EVF, and it's a very good electronic viewfinder. I do love the EVF on the A1, which is like nine point some million dots. That thing is fantastic. Did I notice a difference between this and that? And the answer is, well, no, because I'm just using the R3, so that's the only EVF that I have in front of me. If I was to use an A1 next to it, I probably would've been like, wow, the colors are really nice on this, and it's nice and clear with more dots. Was the 5.76 bad? Not at all. It looked like I was just looking through a viewfinder. Now, there is a new option for making your viewfinder look bright and HDR, kind of like you're looking through an optical viewfinder. Uh, so if you wanna see if your exposure is kind of close, you can go ahead and do that. That's not something that I personally think I'm going to use, but that option is there for those people who are coming from an optical viewfinder and go to electronic viewfinder. You can set that to one of the buttons in the front. It's not bad at all. My question to Canon was, is this the same EVF that's in the R5? Because it's 5.76 million dots. We're like, no, it's all new. And we're like, no, it's probably not. It's probably the same thing. What's new is that it houses the eye control controllers and sensors. So. I think it's probably the same, not a big deal, who cares about that? Let's talk about eye control, because a lot of people think that this eye control is gonna be terrible, that, you know, what if your eye's moving around and the focus is just moving every which way your eye is looking? Well, that's actually not how it works. I was surprised when I set it up. Now, you have to calibrate it in different lighting situations. It's not gonna be perfect in every lighting situation, but it takes a matter of seconds to calibrate it. And the more you calibrate it, the more it learns your eye and how your eye works, and it just gets better and better. So when I went outside to photograph soccer, I calibrated it horizontally, and then I calibrated it vertically, and it works really well. Wherever your eye is looking, there's a small circle inside. Uh, we would love to show you what my eye saw, but we can't do that because it doesn't work unless an eyeball is up to it. We should have taken an eyeball out of something and done it and like literally had an eyeball with a camera cut into it. Shit, we should have thought of that. Someone's gonna do that now. But but yeah, we, we can't show you that exactly. So hopefully we have an example to show you. But when you're looking through, your eye is being tracked. And so wherever your eye is looking, is where you can move a focusing point, but it doesn't actually move a focusing point until you press the shutter button halfway down. So if I'm looking at, say, the goalie right in front of me, well, the the circle is right on him I or her, and I press the button halfway down, and it 
catches the eye or it catches the face. As long as my finger, this is important, as long as my finger is active halfway down pressing the button and the focusing point is locked where it is, it's locked. So I could just be like dooby dooby doo looking off to the side because I know some photographers like to look around the frame or look off to the side away from the camera. As long as your finger is still half pressed, it's still going to be stuck exactly where you need it to be. But where it's really cool is when you lift your finger and you look at somebody to the right. Oh, it's like, well, now it knows it wants you want that person. You press the shutter halfway down and now it locks onto that subject. So where that comes into play is say you've got six runners on the track lane one through six, and you're looking at lane one, you hold the button halfway down, take your picture. Now you lift your finger, look at the person in lane two, hold it down, three, four, and all the way. As long as you lift your finger and move, it's gonna go to where your eye is looking. And it actually works really well. I don't know that I would use it for something like soccer, because I found that sometimes I'd be looking and if there was a distraction in the background, that is where the focus thought it was gonna go. But when it's just a subject by itself, it worked really well and I was pretty surprised about it and I was also surprised that it worked with my eyes because as you can see my eye likes to shake back and forth and when I look through the camera sideways I could see the focusing point the uh, the, the little box the circle going back and forth which is kind of funny but it actually worked for me and it's something that I'm gonna try more and more when I get my hands on the camera. And to add on to that, you can change the sensitivity for how fast that point is moving. Mine was on whatever default was and it moves pretty fast. Steven said he liked it when he slowed it down because maybe he's a little slower and then it didn't jump around as much. If you have multiple people using the same camera, that's okay. There's different memory banks for different people's eyes. So you don't have to like cut off your eye and then put it in the camera it will save it so you could be like number six or sunlight or john smith or jane smith or whatever you want it to be smith and multiple people can use the camera would you like me to send you this free guide to capturing motion in low light situations if you said yes just look for this orange box over on my website put your name email address in it hit send it and i'll send you that guide for free one of the new features added to the R3 is the digital hot shoe that is very similar to what Sony has on the A1 and the A7S3. It's a digital hot shoe. So now if you put a microphone on it, you're getting a digital signal going right into the camera and you don't have to plug anything into the side. Now with the flash, the flash sync speed for people who are wondering who are gonna use electronic shutter is one 1 80th of a second with the electronic shutter. You could actually do 15 frames per second if your flash can you know, keep up with it. And what was that other thing they told us for if you wanted a quick burst of a flash, Steven? One 8,190. Second. of a power. So you can make it like do a boop, boop. You could do a super high, uh, low power flash, just super quick, if you just wanted to get a little bit of extra fill light in there. With the digital hot shoe, Canon's gonna be offering a bunch of different accessories in the future. We don't know what they're all going to be, but they will have more accessories for that hot shoe. Now you have a max shutter speed of 1 64,000th of a second with the electronic shutter. I don't even think you could be outside shooting a 51.2 at 100 ISO and get 1 64,000th of a second in the brightest sun of the day. Maybe if there was an atomic bomb going off and it was super bright, you might be able to freeze it, but hopefully that's not happening ever and we don't have to worry about that. But the Sony does 1 32,000th of a second with the A1. So that just means that if you're shooting at 1 2 outside, you can go past one eight thousandth of a second, which is where all the cameras used to go. Now let's get into how many frames you can shoot with this buffer. You can get 150 max raw shots in a burst. That's five seconds of shooting. If you are shooting for five seconds, I will punch you in the face unless there's actual reason for you to do it, which I don't know there is a reason for that, but it's all about bursts. What I will tell you is that the buffer doesn't debuffer as quick as the 1DX Mark III. The 1DX Mark III had two CF Express Type B cards in there. Super fast, you will never outshoot that thing shooting raw. For whatever reason, Canon thought that the R3 should have an SD card and a CF Express Type B slot. Now what that means is that the SD cards are much slower than the CF Express cards. So you are now dumbing down the camera to the right speed basically of that SD card if you're shooting dual cards, if you're shooting redundant. 
something. So you're basically taking a burst and then waiting for it to write to that SD card because it is much slower. I personally would have preferred two of the same exact card slots and that would be CF Express Type B. Now there's other photographers out there that will say, well, I like having different cards because I have so many SD cards around that I don't have to buy anything extra. You know what, this camera's super expensive to begin with. If you can't afford the memory cards that go into this camera, you probably shouldn't own it. Canon explained to us what one of the reasons may have been for splitting up the types of cards. And they're like, well, what if you're in another country and you can't find a CF Express card easily, you can always find an SD card. And I'm like, yeah, kinda, but generally you're taking all the cards with you when you go and you're not gonna have to go to the corner store to buy an SD card. Now there is one solution around that and Sony has it. That's using a CF Express Type A card slot where they have it dual. The same card slot allows you to use a CF Express Type A and if you take that card out, it can be reverse compatible to use an SD card. So that would be a good compromise. Now, one of the most important things about the R3 is its autofocus and it has what's called dual pixel AF and it's said to be improved over the R5 and the R6, which were already incredible. But what I wanna do right now is show you a montage showing the focusing points in action as I am taking photos. So let's roll that and then we'll come back to discuss it. I know the first thing that people are gonna ask is, what's the hit rate? I don't know what the hit rate is. Every camera is gonna be slightly different and every situation is going to be slightly different. No camera is gonna be perfect and hit 30 frames uh, in a row perfect every time. I mean, some of the examples that I've done are at 1.2 and that's just insane to have someone run towards you at 1.2 and be able to nail it. And what you saw in the video was me shooting with a 402.8 or a 600 F4 or a 70 to 200. 102.8 and it nailed it. Now the way that I look at it is you're gonna get six, seven, eight shots in a row in focus. Then there's gonna be like that one or two that slightly misses for one reason or another, but even if it's like two, three, or even four shots slightly out, that's like a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of your burst. So the whole thing here is when you're doing some quick bursts of like five, six, seven, eight, nine shots, most of them are gonna be nailed time and time again. So the autofocus is super sticky. The tracking is amazing. The dual pixel AF is awesome. And at this point, it is very difficult to say that Sony is the king of the hill, that Sony is the best when it comes to lock on tracking and AF and continuous shooting. It's definitely not Nikon though. I can definitely say that for a fact until we try out an A9, or sorry, correction, until we try out a Z9 when that bad boy comes out. Now, this camera has a Digic X processor also. Canon claims that it's not the same Digic X that's in the five and the six. I can't see it being any different. They would have named it something different. But what they said is that there's different programming for it. So maybe the programming got slightly better for this one, but the R5 and the R6 were already fantastic. And this R3 is even better. I mean, from a distance, for it to grab an eyeball and put the focusing point there from a distance is great. From a distance, 
the world. This is a great song, Stephen. Love it. Now, for the nerds out there who are gonna ask, well, how many calculations a second is it doing? It's doing 60 calculations per second. Now, those of you out there who are nerds already know this, that the A1, nerds, that the A1 does 120 calculations per second. So, is it better? I mean, it does 120. I, I, don't, I think they both work extremely well, and it's hard for me to sit here and say that Canon's better or Sony is better. What I can tell you is that Canon has caught up. It's fantastic. It's still fantastic. The R6 and R5 are fantastic, and this one is even fantastic as well. Let's go to the more notes, because I got page three. Now there's new AF tracking modes. It's designed more like the Sony, where all modes use subject tracking, and it works great. Because with the R5, I use the all AF mode, where I didn't actually have a focusing point available to use. It would just pick where it thought it needed to go, and it was really good right off the bat. With the A1, I have one focusing point active. It's for the lock-on tracking small. That's what I like to use, and I use that to like juice the system to tell the, you know, if it's having trouble to like go here. And it does that really well. But at least I have that active, and then it's, it shows me the eyes, it shows me the faces in a gray box, and then it picks it up really well. The R3 now does that in every mode because IAF, and lock on tracking, or as they call it, subject tracking, is always available in every single mode. I love that that's there for the focusing modes. But what happens if you don't want it to track the subject or if someone's holding out like a paintbrush and you want it to focus on the paintbrush and not on the eye or the face in the background. Well, with one click of a button, because there's so much customization you can do in this camera, you can map out and customize almost every button. In this case, you just hit the button and it deactivates that tracking. You take the photos that you need to take, focus where you need it to focus, you hit that button again, and it goes right back into that tracking mode and you get your subject tracking. But what if you wanna customize the focus area? Something similar to what Nikon has, where they have the box where it's like, if you put this box up here, it's only gonna look for the face and the eye here, which makes it actually work better. Well, Canon put the same thing in on steroids because you can actually expand or contract that box any which way that you want. For example, if you're shooting the US Open for shooting tennis and you don't want it to focus on the actual net as at all, you can make a box that's oblong or elongated like this and move it to above the net so that it's always searching for a person in the situation above the net. It's awesome that you can make it contract and expand however you want. But I also want to say that with the R5, going back to the lock on tracking, is that they actually had a, a menu feature where that's super buried where you could have a focusing point active, but it wasn't active in all modes. In this case, you have that. And to be able to also expand and contract, you could do a super narrow one, you could do a super wide one, you could make it smaller. It is really good that you can customize it for your taste. A small feature that I love love in the Canon mirrorless cameras is when you go vertical, the information display inside with your shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, and anything else actually rotates. So where it's at the bottom when you're shooting horizontally, and then when you go vertical, it actually rotates down to the bottom. We can't show you that in action because we're only recording the feed that's out of the camera, so it doesn't actually rotate there. But when you're looking through, it's there. And another thing I noticed, I had a 14 to 35 on there, and it said, I saw it said 35 millimeter. I'm like, wait a second, if I zoom, it's gonna tell me what it is. And I went to 14 and 15 and 16 and it's right there in the bottom corner. Whereas Nikon has an info display on top of the lens. This, if you're using RF glass, has so much data and information that it puts it right there on the bottom of the viewfinder so you always know. And when Steven was doing B-roll with the 100 millimeter macro with the SA control, he actually had the SA control on and then didn't realize it until he saw it listed in the corner of the viewfinder and was like, oh, I better turn that off because that mode isn't very good. There is a new tracking mode for using tracking cars, is it, Steven? For vehicles like F1 racers and, and all of that, and that's only good for a certain amount of people, we didn't, we didn't test it out, but I guess it's good that they put in different cases. Maybe next I'll put in like helicopters for some reason. I now, if you're someone who shoots in low light, this is gonna focus down to negative 7.5 EV with a 1.2 lens. It's basically focusing in darkness 
which is pretty good. Now, flickering. We've all seen flickering when we've shot. I saw it when I shot the A9 the first time at the soccer game, and there was the banding. I called it banding at the time, but what was happening is a subject was close to me, and they had these lines on them. That was actually the reflection of the LED board that is refreshing at such a rate that it was just showing up in the image. It's not banding, it's the light flickering, which we've learned. Now, the A1 that Sony has, you can dial in one 843.27 of a second to try and match the flickering of the light when you're taking pictures. Well, Canon went ahead and put in high frequency flicker detection as well. So you can set it to all of these different shutter speeds to try and dial it in so it, you don't get that flickering. The old way that it would work is it would be, you would turn on, if you're in a flickering situation, it would wait to take the picture on the err, but not on the flick. So it would wait till the, the, the flicker wasn't happening and shoot in between it, which would, which would slow down your shooting speed. Well, in this case, it will make it perfectly aligned with the exact way that it's flickering. And it's awesome that you can dial in these custom settings. Oh, and also it can auto detect that and set it for you. I didn't mention this earlier, but this is an image stabilized sensor. So you do have IBIS. You're still getting those eight stops of image stabilization when you're using RF glass with IS built in. In. So you're getting awesome stabilization here. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I use for jaredpoln.com because it's simple, easy, and you don't need to know coding. Head on over to squarespace.com slash photo to get your 14 day free trial. If you decide it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now that takes us to the end of the specs for the photo aspect of it. And before I jump into the video specs, because we have another page to do video specs, I want to turn to the computer and analyze some of these images with you because I can't share these raw files or JPEGs with you at this point because it's pre-production. So let's jump into these images right now. All right, so let's take a closer look at these pictures. Um, I just liked how this guy is captured in air right here with the ball popping up. He just made the save. It's a cool shot, but this was cool. The ball was already going by him. I was a little late on the trigger here, but you can see that it is slightly egg shaped. If you get really close, you can see it's not a perfect circle going by him, but this is zooming in a hundred percent and it, it looks great. The colors, the tones, the clarity, it's what you would expect, especially when you're using the new Canon 400 2.8. RF, it's gonna look fantastic. This is an example of extreme bowing going on right here. That is a joke, by the way. Um, you can see how his body is being caught the way that it is. I just thought it was funny, that's why I threw that here. But it was an overcast day because it was between storms, basically, and it, it looks awesome. Um, the colors again, everything's looking great. This is just what you get when you have the 30 frames a second. The ability to pick that shot that you want. I also show these because you can see that the ball isn't perfectly round in this one. It's subtle, but it definitely is there. This right here, I show you because of the eye control. So I'm able to look at the guy in the middle, the Jason Statham looking guy, and I'm able to put the circle there, hit the button, boom, and shoot the picture of him. And then if I wanted to focus on the guy on the left, I would just move my eye, take my finger off the button, press it again, because it knows that I'm looking at this guy, and then I would get his picture. That would be, it, it, it works, it works pretty well. I think it's gonna get better with time, but it's a lot better than I expected it to be. Uh, and, and I may use it. I don't know which situations yet, but it did work at least for this type of situation. Um, so here we have, this is actually 18 pictures, but look, let's just blow right through it. You see how fast this action is, but what this allows you to do is pick that moment. It's the tweener moments. That's what it's all about. It's the subtleness between this and that. Those aren't perfect, but it's just showing you that this happens super fast and you're able to get that many shots as they're happening. You're literally shooting a video at 30 frames per second and then plucking out the one frame. I wouldn't be surprised that it's somewhere in the future we get to 60. I mean, I guess it was rumored that the, that the Z9 could do 160 frames per second. Probably not in 14-bit uncompressed, but 
that's something that I think will happen in the future. Now let's switch gears to outside with little Daniel. Before it absolutely poured, I had him here with the 85-1-2 at 1.2, tracking him and it nails the focus. Uh, it doesn't nail it every time, like I said, when something's running at you and at one, two, but the fact that it would hit, say, I'm not even gonna put a number on it, but the fact that it hit the majority of the shots at 1.2 with someone running at you with a subtle two or three, maybe out every couple is incredible. The fact that it, you could do it at 1.2, you could do that with the Sony as well. We know you can't do that with the Nikon. Um, the reason I'm showing you this shot is you've got the focusing point outside of the range of normality for a DSLR. Just the fact that it picks up his eye up there and this was the composition that I had and it nails it. Am I at one two on this one? Yeah, I'm at one two on this one. I've said it time and time again. I love using IAF and lock on tracking and anybody that's still stuck in the old school ways thinking that this is cheating or isn't, isn't right is just needs to just get with the times because it makes you a better photographer when you know what you're doing, because you can focus on composition while the camera is handling the focusing and where it needs to be so that you can get the decisive moment better. Uh, and that's the way I look at it, I love it. Prime example, 1.2, boom. I was able to pick out at 30 frames per second this leap over that you know really deep puddle that he jumped over at 1.2, nailed it. Just a cool angle where he looks pretty good here. Love the compression. Again, at 1.2, I like the way that this shot looked, the black and white looked good, but I don't have to worry about the focusing points. All I need to do is be damn close and the camera just nails it time and time again. This is where the 30 comes into play. Which do you like more? At first I thought maybe I liked him off ground, but I actually like this step with the heel coming down on the ground. That's what you get with a quick burst you get the ability to select the perfect one that you want. Uh, and it's in focus. Uh, this one's 7200 2.8, so it nails that. Next up, we have a skateboarder. Uh, the focus locked on perfectly for this. And then I wanted him to come straight at me off this jump and it just tracked. And at 30 frames per second, it's just incredible that you can nail it. And then I really didn't do a lot of portraits with anybody. This was like two seconds, found the eyes, nailed it. Um, what are we at? We're at 200 millimeters. I don't think my composition is perfect, but I do like the skin tones, the colors, the, the sharpness, the clarity, everything about this. I'm really happy with the files that we got. When we get to the full real world review, you're gonna get raw files. But now let's jump in to the video specs. Starting with, you get full width DCI 4K up to 60 frames per second, and it's oversampled from 6K or 5.6K. You can also do internal 6K raw recording up to 60 frames per second, and there is no more 2959 limit. That has been lifted. So if you've been looking to do endless recording in 4K, maybe 30 frames per second, you can do that as long as your card can not run out, as long as you have enough space on your card. There is no overheating in 4K, according to Canon, when you're shooting 30 up to 30 frames per second in 4K. So our quick test was 50 minutes and no overheating came up. So hopefully that is the case that it will not overheat if you're shooting say 4K 24P, it's gonna keep going and going and going as long as your card doesn't fill up. Now they say that you could do uh, 4K at 60 frames per second for 60 minutes or more. It all depends on where you are and every situation is gonna be slightly different and you can do up to 60 minutes in 6K raw at 60 frames per second when you switch into the high heat mode, which is basically telling your camera, hey, don't shut down, overheat, but don't tell anybody, it, it, Sony does the same thing. So we haven't tested that out yet. I'm sure somebody else is gonna test that when they get a real unit. Um, but yeah, you're getting some much better time with this camera. For those who wanna kick snow in slow motion, you can shoot 4K at 120 frames per second. And Canon is saying that it's going to be a better, cleaner, sharper uh, piece of video from the R3 than it is going to be compared to the R5. Now keep in mind, this is the only 4K mode that is not over sampled 
in this camera. For those of you who really care, it only offers you C-Log3 and only C-Log3. It doesn't offer you any of the other C-Log modes. Now, what if you wanna connect an Atomos or an external recorder? How do you connect it? Well, it is a micro HDMI and it should have probably been at least a mini HDMI or at the very least a full HDMI, which is what Sony has with the A1. There's plenty of space to put it in there. They should have put it in there. But I guess on the flip side, if you can record internally, you don't need to use the external as often. Now, if you've been watching my videos about the Canon mirrorless for a while, I've always said that I wish I could customize the Q menu, but well, you now have the ability to customize the Q menu. So thank you, Canon, for doing that. For those of you who shoot for agencies and need to wirelessly transfer stuff quickly, you have a lot of functionality inside of this camera to do so. You even have the ability to connect a 5G phone, probably by Sony with ultra wideband, to go ahead and transmit back to wherever you need to transmit back with 5G. So you have those options. Now, let's talk about pricing because you've been waiting a long time to hear about pricing. It's a $6,000 body. It's available sometime at the end of November. Is that correct, Stephen? Sometime at the end of November, but it's six grand. Now let's put that into perspective. The Sony A1 is $6,500 without a grip. It, that means it's gonna be closer to 68 or $6,900 when you add the grip to it. And the Sony A9 II is $4,500 without a grip. So when you add the grip, because you have to have a grip when you're shooting these cameras, you just have to have a grip. Anybody who doesn't have a grip for an A1 or an A9 II, you need a grip, get a grip, get a grip. That, that makes sense, get a grip, get a grip. You like that, Stephen? It's kind of like, get a grip and get a grip. Anyway, so that <laughs> that is funny. And it's like 4,700. So you can see that this is an expensive camera at six grand, but it matches up really well against the Sony A1. It's just less megapixels. If it was 50 megapixels and matched up to it, this would be pretty interesting for six grand. I don't care that it's $6,000. The professionals aren't gonna care that it's $6,000. The agencies aren't gonna care. They're gonna buy them by the boatloads because this is exactly what they've been waiting for in the mirrorless world. I wouldn't be surprised if all press conferences go to silent shooting only. No longer can you use a DSLR or make noise when you're shooting because at this point, if you're not using an electronic shutter uh, camera, then I don't know what you're doing if you're in those news agencies because they've all gone ahead and replaced them. Let me cut in here real quick to remind you that the super huger mega camera giveaway for 2021 is going on right now. And that's where I'm giving one of you the chance to win $4,999.99 of my own money to spend at Allen's camera on anything you want. It could be an R3. You'll just have to bring some extra cash to get it, but you'll be even closer if you win. Now, it is completely free to enter. Head on over to bit.ly slash megafro2021 for your chance to win. Now, if you pick up Fro Pack 1, Fro Pack 2, Fro Pack 3, or the Fro Pack bundle, you will score extra entries towards winning the grand prize. Now, you don't need to purchase presets in order to win, so go over to bit.ly slash megafro2021 for your chance to win. So what are my final thoughts? I know it's a long video, but I appreciate you guys sticking around to get here. If you have gotten here, just say, I got here and give it a thumbs up. Um, my final thoughts are, are, are trying to figure out who it's for. We know it's for those agency shooters. We know it's for sports shooters. If you're a professional and this is what your job is, then this $6,000 is gonna pay itself off over and over and over again. It's going to be worth it. If you're a wedding photographer, you probably don't need the R3 if you already have an R5. The R5 is a fantastic camera with 45 megapixels. It shoots at 12 frames per second mechanical and 20 frames per second with silent, the electronic shutter. And if you're not shooting a lot of fast moving action, it's gonna be perfectly fine when you're shooting in silent and it's less expensive. Or if you're just one of those everyday sports shooters or even weddings, you can get away with an R6. It's a 22-ish $100 body, then you add a grip, you're at 25, 2600. That camera's fantastic. It has the same focusing system as the R5. It has the same processor as a, a 1DX Mark III. It has the same sensor, basically, as the 1DX Mark III. That R6 is fantastic. You may not need this R3. 
I personally would use the R3. I would have an R5 also in case I needed more megapixels, but I'd pick up the R3 if I was shooting Canon. That would be my go-to body because, because of feel, because of speed, because of so many things that it has. I just love what it offers me. That's the camera that I personally would buy if I was shooting Canon. Now, right now, I'm using an A1, and I know some people wanna know, would I replace my A1 with this one? And I'm gonna say, not yet. I'm still spoiled by that 50 megapixels at 30 frames per second, even though I only shoot at 20 frames per second because I, I don't wanna dumb down the file. But I will tell you that I prefer the feel of the Canon body. I prefer the way that that feels in my hands. It just feels better than the Sony. The shutter button feels better than the Sony. The build quality feels better than the Sony. Not to say that I've had any issues, knock on wood, with the Sony A1. That's fantastic. And the other thing that I prefer on the Canon side is the RF glass. I just think Canon's on a better trajectory to have better pro options than what Sony has. Sony has a massive jump. They've got some very nice G Master lenses, but they seem to be all over the place with what they're doing. And you've got some Sigma options, which are definitely great. They're more affordable and they're nice, but I just feel that Canon is gonna continue to add to the RF lineup and it's just gonna be better professional glass for someone like me and I'm gonna be happy with it. So it is possible that one day I I could grab a Canon as my go-to system. It's not gonna be today, it's not gonna be right now, but I would not kick the R3 out of bed if that's all I had to shoot with. Will I get an R3? Well, the answer is they're gonna send me an R3, so hopefully I get to keep it for a while. But yeah, it's gonna be a tough choice deciding, do I wanna take the R3 or do I wanna take the A1? And I think the reason I'll take the A1, Stephen, is because we can record the EVF and I can use it for teaching. That's something that I can't do on the Canon unless they make me a custom firmware, but that's first world problems. So that's where I'm gonna leave it. I wanna thank, ooh, I cracked my voice. I wanna thank Steven for his hard work on all the B-roll and doing everything that he needed to do to get this video together. I wanna thank Canon for bringing the camera down early and allowing us to do this. And I wanna thank you guys for sticking around and watching this and in hopefully enjoying it. And that's it. When we get a production unit, we're gonna spend time testing it out just like I've been doing with the A1, doing as many shoots as possible before we bring you a thorough, full-on, real-world review. So that's it. Jared Polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.